Hi, and welcome to The Horse Racing Show. I'm Kenny Rice. The Horse Racing Show. Already you're thinking, wow, you blew a budget, didn't you? Thousands of dollars spent on consultants, hours spent on focus groups. Nah, we saved all that money. It's a simple show about a sport that can be complicated, complex, but people that will make it simpler for you, even the hardcore racing fans we hope over the next few weeks, as we'll be visited from trainers to veterinarians and all in between that get horses from the barn or the farm to the racetrack. That is the purpose of this, the horse racing show. Damon Runyon once said, and you know, winning is important. And Damon Runyon, you might remember, the very colorful writer. He was a sports writer. He was an author of short stories, and many of his short stories became plays or movies. He once uh, took a little fun uh, bit of Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 11, and played with that a little bit, where he said, the race doesn't always go to the swiftest or to the strongest, but that is the way to bet. And betting again is part of it. And then again, you're saying, what, a Bible verse already? Are we going to ask for money? No, that may come a little later on in the show. But trust me, anyone that's ever made a bet, they're praying as their horse is coming down the stretch. All of a sudden, everybody finds religion in a photo finish. Um, Ecclesiastes also, by the way, the birds took a text from that and turned it into a hit called Turn, Turn, Turn. See, different layers. It all works out, we think. We hope. Getting back to Damon Runyon. Yes. Do you have a movie that you really like that features his characters? Ladies and gentlemen, Thomas Kenny joining us. Yes. You know what I do, Thomas? Uh, and, and the characters became famous as Runyon-esque. He wrote a lot about bookies and racetrack people and, and the boxing world people and actors. And they were always colorful guys and they had great names. Little Miss Marker, one of the great stories that ties in with horse racing. Go to the original one made in 1934. Shirley Temple is the little marker. Her daddy couldn't afford to pay off the bookie. So he says, hold my daughter so I can get the money and I'll come back and pick her up. Little Miss Marker, 1934, Shirley Temple. Sorrowful Jones was the name of the bookie. He had great names for his characters. Adolphe Mijou played Sorrowful Jones. Thank you for that, Thomas. You're welcome. All right. Uh, like I say, many layers in this sport of kings, which, by the way, also the name of a rock album and also the name of a novel, The Sport of Kings. All right, coming up this weekend, it's the Pegasus. It's a big day. It went from a $12 million race to a $16 million race. Now it's a $9 million race because they're going to put $7 million into turf racing. They're going to have two big races this weekend uh, at the Pegasus. And the good thing about the Pegasus, it gives a chance for an older horse. You get one more look at him, uh, like we'll get to see with Accelerate before then he goes to the barn for stud duties, much as we did last year for Gunrunner, much as we did in 2017 in the inaugural event for Arrogate. It gives them a place to come one more time because that's one of the troubles with horse racing uh, as far as uh, – I guess capturing a broader public, you only get to see these horses for a brief period of time, which leads to this. The Eclipse Awards are also coming up this week. Now, we're taping this in advance, but I'll give you three predictions right now. Justify will be the three-year-old of the year. Monomoy Girl will be the three-year-old filly of the year. And the older horse on the dirt, of course, will be Accelerate. They're locks. They're also three nominees for the horse of the year. It's down to those three. But that is the Eclipse Awards, created in 1971 by the National Thoroughbred Association, the Daily Racing Forum, and the National Turf Riders Association, and named for the 18th century great horse from Great Britain, Eclipse. You ever seen an Eclipse Award, Kenny? Thomas, thank you for that unsolicited and unrehearsed question. It just so happens, yes, I have won an Eclipse Award. It looks like this. And that is quite a proud achievement of mine. It really is. Uh, and the great thing about an Eclipse Award, you know, it takes you all the way to death. Because sometimes the Daily Racing Forum or the Blood Horse or some of the trade publications, when you die, they'll say, Eclipse Award winner will be in there. So all you Eclipse Award winners this year, something to look forward to in your obit when you take home one of these. And remember, there are no losers. Oh, yes, there are. If you're in the finals, you want to win one of these things. 
Now, the big one is the gold one for Horse of the Year. That's what's going to make this really interesting because it's never before happened. You have an undefeated Triple Crown winner in Justify who pulled off in 111 days something no horse has ever done. No one. Secretariat, Seattle Slough, Man of War, none of them. Unraced as a two-year-old, 111 days of racing under the great leadership of trainer Bob Baffert and the, the guidance of jockey Mike Smith. He wins the Triple Crown. He doesn't lose a race, and he's retired. Some would think maybe he should have stayed around and raced, as American Pharaoh did in 2015 when he won it. No, he's retired. He's standing stud. Meanwhile, Accelerate, who by far was the best older horse. Question was, could he run outside of California? Well, yes, he could. He came to the Churchill Downs, won the Breeders' Cup Classic. So those horses are neck and neck. Who's going to be the horse of the year? Because here's the one thing. You can say, well, it's proven on the track. No, it isn't. When it comes to this, they go to the ballot box. I will speak as one of the Eclipse voters. Not telling you who I voted for, but you might get an idea. It becomes subjective. This is when horse racing becomes figure skating. It becomes in the eyes of the beholder. It's not necessarily they won this race, they won this race. So there's a mixed camp right now because Justify Brilliant Hard to go against an undefeated Triple Crown winner. I mean, that's a lock, isn't it? Not necessarily so. People are going to be thinking, people being the voters, are going to be saying, well, he should have stayed around. He didn't stay around. It had been good for racing to stay around. Good for racing is used to death. I don't know what is good for racing. You have business people that own racehorses. Whatever's good for them generally turns out to be whatever's good for them and therefore should be, I guess, whatever's good for racing because racing relies on business people, primarily rich people, to run their horse races. That's just the way it works out. Accelerate, though, will get a lot of interest. It will be interesting, and we will talk more about that later on. But meanwhile, Back to Eclipse, because some people might have won this award, and they don't even know who Eclipse was. He was undefeated in 18 races. Undefeated in 18 races. Won a match race in there, and then after racing only 17 months, which was longer than Justify, by the way, he was retired. That was it. End of career. Do you know why he was retired, Kenny? Thomas, you have been doing the research on this. Why is that? He won so many races, uncontested, that no one would bet against him. Aha. Uh -huh. That good. The GOAT, as they would say in this day and age, greatest of all time, perhaps. Certainly, Eclipse, you'd have to put him up there amongst them. Again, the Royal Veterinarian College stated that Eclipse is the ancestor of 80% of thoroughbred racehorses. And therefore, this is the name of the award. Who's your friend, Thomas? It's my friend, April. Hi, April. Hello. Thank you for smiling and enjoying the show so far. You're sure welcome. All right, coming up, thank you for being with us today. Uh, today, we're going to run the gamut. We're going to talk to an owner, one of the most entertaining guys in all of racing. Mike Pegram will join us when we come back in a few minutes on the Horse Racing Show, brought to you by Rude and Riddle Equine Hospitals. And uh, also, Dr. Tom uh, Riddle will be joining us, and we'll talk about the foaling industry, about why is it January 1st, the birth date for a horse, and then Monomoy Girl, we talked about how spectacular she was this past year. We'll talk to Brad Cox, her trainer. All that's coming up on this unrehearsed, no teleprompter version of The Racing Show. Welcome back to The Horse Racing Show, a simple show that tells you about horse racing each week. When they said, who do you want as your first guest, without hesitation, I said, Mike Pegram is the only one I want to get this show on the road. Uh, I've known him for years. He's a great friend. I don't know any owner that enjoys racing as much as Mike and really enjoys when he wins or when he gives it a try. And, of course, you know, real quiet, silver bullet day, great horses that he's had among many. And he joins us now from right outside of Reno, Nevada in Carson Valley, I do believe. Mike, welcome into the show. Thank you, Kenny, and thanks for the kind words. Well, as you know, I mean them, and you know, and everybody in racing is not as sincere as you and I are. Well, everybody in racing don't have as much fun as you and I do. <laughs> we know we know we ain't dealing with brain surgery here. <laughs> you know, I always laugh about that, and it it's a tough audience sometimes. I did four, I hosted four Eclipse Awards, and it's wonderful, and 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 everybody that wins them, and you've won them, it's all great. But but sometimes people do ask. That, that seems to be kind of a, a very stoic award ceremony, say, compared to Oscars, Emmys, uh, any kind of sports show. You know, some people don't get into it as much as we do. Oh, isn't that the truth? There's, there, there's been a couple of those I wanted to take a pillow to. 
But, uh, hey, we're changing, though. I heard they got Snoop Dogg playing down at the Pegasus this weekend for uh, headlining their uh, entertainment for the, the big Pegasus event. So I'd love to see Snoop Dogg at the uh, the Eclipse Award. I don't I don't think he'd go over real good. You know, Snoop Dogg at the Eclipse Awards, wouldn't that be interesting, Mike? Because you know halfway through with the, just a, you know, just a secondhand thing, everybody would be getting up going back and getting extra potato chips and Doritos. <laughs> well, there's one thing about it. They wouldn't have to be censoring my horse's name anymore after Snoop Dogg got done with them. Well, <laughs> and that brings me to this. Before we talk about uh, any more of the horses, the names. You were you were on the on the no fly list, as we'll say, of the Jockey Club for many years. You might still be on it because of such names as "Is It In Good" and a few other names that you named your horses. That uh, the Jockey Club thought, well, maybe we ought to take a second look. Uh, that was after obviously got on the track and had success. I always enjoyed that. I always wondered what name is Mike Pegram coming up with next. Uh, we had a little fun with them, and they they didn't have they didn't appreciate the humor of some of the stuff. But on the other hand, like I always told them, we're not at Disneyland. We we are we are at gambling. We are out here losing money, drinking beer, and having fun. And uh, again, I never named a horse that I wouldn't say in front of my mother. And uh, I had more respect for her than any woman in the world. So I figured if I put it on paper, they should accept the name. But you know what, Kenny? They didn't see it that way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you you can't have fun in this sport sometimes. Football, basketball, baseball, you can have fun. Sometimes you can't in horse racing. What can I say? But we're trying yeah, to... All I, we don't look as ridiculous as some of these wide receivers that score touchdowns. I, I would like to talk to those guys and ask them, what in the hell are they thinking when they do some of the stuff they do in the end zone? That makes my name look tame. Yeah, Yeah, it does make your name look tame. Uh, by the way, are you are you good now with the Jockey Club? I mean, do you get your names approved, or uh, do you still kind of a little uh, battle of wits? Nah, you know what? Since I got in partners with uh, Paul and Carl, uh, they name both the horses. If I come up with a good one, we'll get it. But it's uh, maybe I have matured as I've gone along a little bit. It just it's not as important as it was at one time, but. It did get to be one up and ship there for a while. Yeah, and I think for people that know, obviously, in the game, for those of you that are uh, watching, listening to this that don't know, uh, the Jockey Club has to approve the names. Uh, it can only be 18 characters. That's why you see a lot of names run together sometimes so they can get all 18 in there. And then they have to have the approval uh, to make sure it's not too risque or it's not named after somebody famous that they didn't get the approval from. I basically cleared that up, didn't I, Mike? Yep, you sure did. And you know, and, and Mike, Mike, would you put some fun names in there sometimes? What's your best name that you got in? Oh, the best name, uh, uh, the best name uh, I ever had, and they took away from me uh, was uh, "Liquor in Excess," <laughs> and that didn't make it. No, it made it. Oh, it made then, it. Uh, Something so it, somebody knew, and we had it in the entry box, and they they seen the name and said it was obscene, and I said there ain't nothing obscene about it. You drink liquor in excess, and and that's called drunkenness. That's called intoxication. I want to name the the uh, horse liquor in excess because it was an excess filly, and uh, they refused it. So then I said, okay, if you think it's re- obscene, name her liquor. L I Q U O R. They wouldn't accept the word liquor. I said, "Are you telling me there's obscene names up and down every street that has liquor stores?" <laughs> but it didn't work. And we ended up settling on censored because they <laughs> censored me. So I just said, "The hell with you guys. We're censored." <laughs> so that that's the way that one hooked up. And I had my little grandson Gator. He had two imaginary. Uh, friends that he'd have horse races with and one was pay my bills and the other one was button my pants so i submitted the name button my pants they would not accept the name button my pants said it was i'm seeing i said i didn't say unbutton my pants i said button my pants so anyway uh, that's when that's when I poked a little fun and and Buddy Bishop, who was a good man, that had yes, a he, tough job. He certainly is. And, he was. Uh, yes. So, but, so finally, I end up naming that horse. Buddy named me. Oh, I like that. 
I bet Buddy appreciated that too, didn't he? Yeah, a matter of fact, I think Buddy named me one, uh, one, one on Derby Day one year. I remember Buddy named me. Yeah. So, so yeah, here's what here's what we've learned from this uh, class watching in today. Uh, keep your pants buttoned and don't drink liquor at a racetrack. I think that's the theme there, right, Mike? <laughs> I think you got it, Kenny. I think that's what. See, I knew you were the perfect guy to get this thing going. Uh, let me ask you about McKenzie right quick. It was going to run this weekend into Pegasus after winning the Malibu late into, uh, last year at opening day at Santa Anita. It's not going to run uh, now in the Pegasus. And what's next? Or have you talked to Bob Baffert, your trainer, much about that? No, nah, Bobby, the reason we didn't go to the Pegasus, you know, he laid a big egg at the Breeders' Cup because the horse was off in the Pennsylvania Derby. And Bobby still thinks he brought the horse back too quick to run him in the Breeders' Cup, and he just said, you know what, I just don't feel right shipping him down there. The horse is doing well. So, again, I haven't really discussed it with Bob, but the two logical races that's going to come up after the Pegasus, you can go to Oakland and run for a half a million in the Razorback, which I think is President's Weekend, or we can stay at home and run a mile and a quarter in the Santa Anita Handicap the first weekend of March. So, I think you'll see McKenzie turned up in, in one of the, one of those two places, and then after that, Bobby will have to decide whether he goes to Dubai. And uh, I kind of don't think he'll send him there uh, because, again, we'll have a fresh horse, and uh, there's nothing like winning in the good old USA and having some some fun with your friends and seeing your horses win. And I think he's going to be a real good four year old this year. You and Bob Baffert, your friendship, your relationship uh, professionally goes back. We're talking decades now. That's when I first met you guys. It was 92. Uh, you won the Breeders' Cup with 30 Slew. You won a Breeders' Cup race at, at, down at Gulfstream Park. I remember that. I'm sure you remember. You probably don't remember me interviewing you, but you remember that. Hey, I don't remember anything except the bags full of money. We had grocery bags full of money. If you remember, that was before, the, uh, before you had the uh, – all the money go in one pool because I remember 30 slews paid, I think it was $32 a golf stream. He paid $55 in New York. He only paid 1280 in California, but we had money spread all over the place because we knew we had a live horse that day. And I'll tell you a funny story on that one. Eddie Delahousie came into the, uh, the paddock and Bobby was nervous as hell first million dollar race and so on and so forth and Bobby told Eddie he said hey you know we got a chance to win it he said Bob I could have rode four other horses in here I know we're gonna win it <laughs> <laughs> how did and you Eddie <laughs> go ahead no no please tell me more about I love his team I love those stories I don't know, but you know, Eddie read what I was going to do is compliment the great, the little great filly that, that we ran down that day it was me, Farah. Yeah, that's right. And it, it, I mean, oh, Eddie just wore her down, wore her down, and those two grays hit the finish line. And I think it was the first race of the day of the Breeders' Cup. It wasn't the first race today, but it was the first Breeders' Cup race. And I know AP Indy ended up winning that day. I think Paulson's won three, but. We, that was a day of a party, all I can tell you. That's that. That's when uh, the racing world got a little taste of Bob Baffert. And, and since 92, he's just been on a terror, and uh, I'm just glad I can say I was part of it, and I'm his friend. And, and how did this friendship develop with that quarter horse trainer who's become uh, arguably the greatest of all time, one of the greatest of all times for sure in the thoroughbred business? Uh, it, it was funny is I uh, – I had owned thoroughbreds with my father and uh, through the early, late 70s, early 80s. And then I went through one of those, th one of those things that always set you back financially called a divorce. So yeah. I, got out, I got out of the horse business and I had met a family down in Arizona that was in the quarter horse business. Uh, matter of fact, it was Hal Earnhardt. And Hal called me up one day, and he says, hey, would you buy a quarter horse with me? And quarter horses wasn't there as expensive as thoroughbreds. And I said, yeah, I'll go in with you. So I got a trainer named Bob Baffert. So I said, yeah, I'm in. So long story short, I met Bobby. And uh, from there, 
I started buying some quarter horses with him, and that's the way the relationship happened. And what's really ironic, so it was Hal Earnhardt that introduced me to Bobby. And the year that I win the Derby with Will Quiet, Hal Earnhardt had the favorite in the Derby, which was Indian Charlie. Indian Charlie, that's right, the one-two punch that Baffert brought in that year. So Indian Charlie went off the favorite. He ended up running third. But, I mean, I'm sitting there looking at him and says, how can you figure here's two guys that meet in Arizona? He introduced me to Baffert. And this would have been 1985. And here, 13 years later, you're running against each other in the uh, greatest race in the world. Uh, you know what? That's that's the favorite thing. Stories like that, I think, appeal as much, I mean, let's face it, people are going out and gambling. That's it. They don't gamble. They don't have races. We know that. But those kind of stories appeal to people, I think, in general and get people interested in the sport as much as trying to teach them for the first time out how to how to wheel a trifecta or something like that. You know, let them learn a little bit about the people and the, and the personalities, and I think they come to the track more. That maybe drives them more. Oh, there's, there's no doubt. It's, it, it's no different than what – Racetrack's the only place in the world where a billionaire will ask the guy parking his car, who you like. <laughs> that's true, isn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah. Here's a guy that's got hose in his shoes because he's running and picking up cars, and here's a guy that's made fortunes in his life, and he's asking him for advice. I mean, I love the racetrack. I love race trackers. I mean, I, you know, when you enjoy racing at Ellis Park, that means you really love the sport. And, uh, and I'm not knocking Ellis Putton Park because uh, that's where I cut my teeth on this sport. And I could I can remember begging my dad to take me every every day that he went when I was a kid. And so it's but it, it's what it is. It's the camaraderie of this sport that uh, that you get it from every gambler to gambler, horse owner to horse owner and all the way through. Now, I can't ask you to pick a favorite horse. That, that's impossible. But I mean. There's so many, you know, from Captain Steve looking at Lucky. We know about real quiet. Silver Bullet Day, still one of my all-time favorite fillies. Midnight Loot, uh, you know, going back to 30 slews. The, do you have one or two memories of some of those, though, that just really stand out for whatever reason, to be at the victory celebration or just the craziness of getting, getting them to the track uh, when you didn't expect it to happen? Well, real quiet is the key, the gift that kept on giving because – he was the sire of a uh, midnight loot. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can tell you all sorts of little tidbits on Real Quiet, but Real Quiet, I mean, he was a horse that, you know, everybody knows the story. He was bought for $17,000. I can remember having dinner at uh, Dudley's the night they bought the horse because I just came in and said, hey, we bought the fish. I said, who's the fish? And they showed me the page. And unbeknownst a lot of people real quiet was a well-bred horse yeah and um and i looked at the page i said how much did he cost they said seventeen thousand. i said does he have cancer <laughs> they said no i said well why are you calling him the fish he said well he's like a tropical fish he looks beautiful from the side but when he comes at you straight up if you put up your finger you can't see him <laughs> he was so thin but you know he was the ugly duckling that uh, grew up into this big, beautiful, magnificent horse. Yeah. That, uh, you know, they should have won the Triple Crown, but, you know, that's the way racing luck hits. Uh, but then he did come back and uh, he starred two great horses for me. One was Pussycat Doll, who was a multiple grade one winner. And then the other one was uh, Midnight Loot, who has gone on to be a, a very. Um, reputable stallion in himself so that's the reason i say real quiet's the horse that just keeps on giving oh yeah and, and that was that was a special year and brought a lot of excitement and honestly i wasn't even sure if we'd see a triple crown winner at least in my lifetime i'd seen so many close ones like that when a silver charm the year before and we go on and on but then that buddy of yours he's pulled it off twice in the last four years that's pretty amazing isn't it well, and I, I got another one for you on this one, and I, I still believe this in my heart of hearts, and everybody's got opinions in the horse business because that's what makes the horse business. But I always said that Baffert would buy a triple-pound winner, and not 
taking nothing away from American Pharaoh or Justified, but Bobby didn't buy either one of those horses. Mm-hmm. American Pharaoh was bred by Zayad, and um, and I think Elliot picked out uh, um, Justified, and Bobby just trained him. So I still think before Baffert's done, he's going to win a Triple Crown with not only is he a great horse trainer, the, what this man has done, well, the only reason why people know me is the, the quality of horses that he bought during the early days for not a whole lot of money. So he is a tremendous horseman, and I hope he does get his third. Yeah, it would be appropriate if that happened that his partner in that horse would be you. Uh, he's got a lot of good owners. He's got a, a lot of great owners, and that's the, that's one thing about Bobby that speaks so well to him. And, you know, we all know how irreverent he can be at times. And matter of fact, he can almost be a half asshole. But he, uh, <laughs> you've seen that side, Kenny. Uh, yeah, I have a couple, a couple of times. But honestly, if you guys weren't irreverent, it wouldn't be any fun to talk to you. Oh, no, that, that's true, but that's the reason why the good Lord gave him that uh, white hair, so he can look like Einstein. <laughs> you, know, you know, now more than ever, he'll be listening to this show, won't he? <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. He'll, he, I'll, be, I'll, be getting, I'll be getting a text. What the hell are you saying on there? He'll say, what is, this, what is this horse racing show with Kenny Rice? What is this thing? When did this come from? <laughs> he'll probably say, who is this Kenny Rice guy? Oh, that's that guy that interviews me when I keep winning those big races. Oh, gosh. Uh, there's one thing about Bob. Have you ever seen a camera you didn't love? No, and you know one of the, the great things about him, and, and I've I really got to know him better on those trips, obviously on those derby runs with uh, starting in 96 with uh, Cabinier, Um is that, you know, he was like, and, and Wayne Lucas, I think, was the guy that kind of set that standard, really, and then Bob just jumped right in on it, too, being able to speak in sound bites, as we say in the business, being able to give you know, 10, 15, 20%, uh, 20 second interview answers uh, that made sense, it made you laugh, made you think. And, and, you know, Baffert's got it down pat. He's had it that way for 20 some years. He is, a, he's probably the most witty and uh, person that I know. And, and the thing about Bobby is, and, and I say this with all sincerity and respect, he doesn't have a malice bone in his body. No, I mean some of the stuff he says to people. I said, if I said that, they'd knock me on my butt. But he can say it. And he he says it without malice, and and uh, and he's he's truly a funny. He's a funny guy. Well, you you both are always entertaining. And I, here's an unsolicited here's an unsolicited testimony. If you're ever out in the Reno area, go to the Carson Valley Inn and stay. I love the place. Yes, my friend Mike owns it. I love the place. So even if he wasn't on the show. And uh, it's got, it, you know what, it reminds me of the old days, like when you'd go out to old Vegas and enjoy yourself. It's not, it's not corporate run, you know, you don't have to buy your tickets in advance and stuff. That's, that's what I loved about it. And the food's great, by the way. Uh, we're, we're country folk, Kenny. That's all I can tell you. We, we, it's, uh, you treat people the way you want to be treated and good things happen. Well, I'll ask you one more thing. It's a successful casino owner operator as well. Uh, you know, I, I wish there was some way, and I don't have it, and, and if I did have it, I'd make them pay me a big consulting fee like they have for a lot of things they've done. But I'd tell racing, you know, maybe figure out a way to let people in at a reduced price for not the triple crown, not the big events, but every day out there. Figure out a way to let them park a little cheap or something. Give them a program because, you know, you can go to a casino, you can lose money, and somebody gives you a buffet ticket free, and you figure, what the heck, it was only 500 bucks, and look, I get to eat a nine ninety five buffet free. <laughs> hey, I had an old marketing guy tell me one day, he said, the closer you get to free, the easier my job is. <laughs> That's the truth, isn't it? <laughs> it sure is. Oh. It sure is. So it's, uh, but I tell you, I, I, I thank you for thinking about me doing this call because I always love talking about these horses and this industry because it, it's been a big part of my life and, uh, I can never imagine living and, and not being part of it. Well, listen, thanks very much, my friend, and uh, I look forward to having Mike Pegram on any time he wants to come on, and especially if Snoop Dogg brings down the house, and I mean that literally, at the Eclipse Awards. We'll have to come and revisit this. You got it, Kenny. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you very much, Mike Pegram, our very first guest here on the Horse Racing Show.
Welcome back to the Horse Racing Show. We're happy to have with us Dr. Tom Riddle of Root and Riddle. Uh, doctor, we said at the start, we're going to try to make this show simple, peel back some layers of horse racing. Thank you for your time today. Sounds good to me. Thank you very much for having me. One thing to peel back early on here is uh, a lot of people have asked over the years and, you know, covering the sport as I have, why is January 1st the universal date for thoroughbreds? Everybody turns a, different, uh, turns a year older on January 1st. You know, in the, in the northern hemisphere, that's true for almost all breeds, including thoroughbreds, and they had to pick a day. Uh, to keep everybody together and uh, they came up with January 1st um, back in the 60s 1970s uh, they started putting mares under lights and mares at that time or any time would cycle better if they were exposed to lights beginning about 60 days before you wanted them to cycle regularly and so if they put the mares under lights December 1 they would start cycling in February usually, and then they would get the mares bred on, uh, in February, so they would start to foal in January. And they said, well, let's choose January 1 as our universal date, mm -hmm. and that's why they did it. And you want those foals, and you want, to, you want to get those mares in foal in February, if at all possible, don't you? February, March, not too much later, because you're going to have a very young horse that uh, actually isn't, but technically is one year old. Absolutely. It, it really helps to have that early birth date, although there have been a number of very good horses that are born, have been born later in the year, April, May, um, but the majority do better if they're born early. They, they're more muscular, they mature faster, and they sell better usually. And so people like those early birth dates. And the gestation period isn't nine months, as we would associate with humans. No, it's, it's on average about 11 months and five days, 11 months and a week. There's some variation in that, just like there is in people. Some mares go early, some mares go late. But on average, about 11 months and a week. Worst scenario, isn't it, for a breeder is to have a late foal? Well, not the worst always, but, you know, you get a late foal and they're maybe not as developed much and they're going to turn one. You know, they... You don't like to have late foals. Uh, a lot of people breed for the commercial market, so they, they're breeding to sell as yearlings. And the yearlings do better if they're bigger and more mature. Uh, that's been st statistically proven. And so uh, they like for them to be born early. Uh, probably a bigger disaster is if they were born uh, prior to January 1, because then, say they were born December 25th Christmas oh, Day yeah. uh, then January 1 they're going to be a year old and so they're definitely going to be behind their age group and it's not like you can go back and say can, can I get you don't get a do-over on it you don't get a mulligan on this and, and I guess you can't go and say well listen he's like a week old technically do we have to give him a year it's a it's a year because that's the rule that's the rule that's the rule absolutely there has to be a rule people have to have guidelines and so it's a risk they take if they breed the mare early uh, in, in February. They could, if she went very early, uh, get a foal in, in December. Now, as far as a veterinarian standpoint, when would you be out or, or someone from Rudin Riddle be called out to the farm and you check on the mares? and every Because it, it, it is a very technical process and it is a very precise process, the whole breeding. Contrary to what some people think where it's just two horses fall in love and have a baby. <laughs> it's, it's a very defined business. So uh, It is. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on the way you look at it, it's a very mechanical process. Um, we put mirrors under lights December 1 so that they will start cycling and be cycling regularly, we hope, by February. And then we are able to get the mare bred. And when we send the mare to the breeding shed, um, it's anything but... It's called natural cover, but it's anything but natural. There are usually about six or seven people involved in the breeding. The mare ships to the farm. She's unloaded. She's cleaned up. The stallion is brought into the shed. He's cleaned up. He mounts the mare. Uh, and there are usually about six or seven people involved in the whole process. No Sinatra music, no flowers? No, no, no. It's not anything romantic. Uh, but they are letting nature take its course. The stallion gets attracted to the mare, obviously, yeah. and then they, the breeding takes place. 
uh, the lights, you know, we talk about putting the mares under lights. So lights would be to make them think that it's uh, right, a different time to, of year. Right. They're trying to simulate the oncoming of spring. Mm -hmm. And so we put the mares under lights for 16 hours a day. Uh, most people start lights, say, at 7 o'clock in the morning, and then they're turned out later in the morning, and they're usually out all day, and then they come in at night. And they're under lights at night until 11 o'clock. So eight hours of darkness, 16 hours of daylight. It works in the stall. It can also work if the mirror is in a lighted paddock. As long as there's nothing she can hide behind, as long as she's exposed to the light for those 16 hours, she should be fine outside. Although there's the lights are the primary reason the mirrors cycle early, but if the temperature is too cold, um, the mirror isn't going to cycle as well. So warmth helps. Um, so ideally you would like for the mirror to either be blanketed or in a stall so that she is kept a little bit warmer than she would if she were out fighting the elements. I wonder how is, uh, we, l we look at this each year on NBC when we're getting ready to do the show, how many actual three-year-olds actual three-year-olds are all three-year-olds obviously because of the january 1st universal date but how many actual three-year-olds run several of them become three-year-olds over the course of the triple crown absolutely absolutely there there certainly are uh, a number that don't become three until may or even after the derby uh, but on average the majority of, of kentucky derby winners say are born earlier in the year february or march along with the majority of thoroughbred foals so it's an odds game uh, most foals are born early part of the year, so most derby winners are born uh, at the same time. So it is, it is the science of breeding. It is the science of getting them ready to get to the track someday, they hope. Absolutely. Absolutely it is. And, and obviously, like, like humans, you don't know exactly what time. I mean, I guess sometimes you induce labor, but you, you may be delivering in the middle of the night. You may be delivering early in the morning. No, it, it's, it could happen at, at any time. Most mares do fall in the evening and the dark hours, um, probably because of the evolutionary process. Mm -hmm. um, they're able to uh, protect their foal better at night, they think, and so that's why they're falling then. My mom obviously thought the same thing. I was born at 11.45 at night. I was. Right. I was. My, right. sis my sister was like 11.30, I think. We were night babies. I know. A lot of, a lot of women fall in the evening hours, too. Uh, but I think it's probably more evenly scattered throughout the day. So people don't even know this, do they? A lot of people, people probably are hanging around the track today that said, I did not realize that about the lights and getting the mares ready. And, and I guess they don't have to. They just have to say, I noticed he had a big race at the fairgrounds and he's coming to Kentucky. You know, I think that you're exactly right. A lot of people that are very, very much in the horse business don't know about the breeding end. And a lot of people in the breeding end don't know about the horse training business. So it, it makes sense that you don't know everything. There are a few people that have had exposure to almost all elements of horse racing, but most people have one or the other, but not both. In some ways, it's probably for the best. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think so. I mean, I think the, those people that know um, a little bit about everything are very valuable but um, that doesn't mean that somebody um, doesn't have great success, even if they're not aware of what goes on in all aspects of the business. As far as like at Rude and Riddle, you do cover all aspects, don't you? I mean, there's probably from the surgeries to the foaling, everything in between, horses on the track, horses that are being retired, whatever the situation. We do. We're, we're very fortunate. We've got about 58 veterinarians in Lexington and about 10 or 12 in New York, and about 10 in Florida. And so we're trying to cover all aspects of uh, the, the breeding industry and the f performance industry. They can, uh, we have veterinarians that take care of the mares. We have veterinarians that take care of the foals. We have veterinarians that take care of the yearlings that go to the sales. And we have veterinarians that take care of the horses that are, are running at uh, uh, any kind of performance issue they have. With their running, uh, we have veterinarians that can address that. You know, most people, well, I don't say most people, but a lot of people out there, a lot of people even follow horse racing, they probably don't realize that, like the Kentucky Derby and the Triple Crown, which are obviously, the Derby especially, and then the rest of the Triple Crown races, are the focus of the year. And then later on, the Breeders' Cup. But at that stage, like a three-year-old horse, 
has been likened mostly to, say, a, a teenage basketball player who suddenly comes into college. Uh, it's, their, their maturity is still probably a year or two away, even though they're running in the most famous race at three. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, most of the thoroughbreds are not fully mature when they're running at three, and toward the end of their three-year-old year, or maybe even into their four-year-old year, they reach their full maturity, and they may even get better at that time. Doctor, it's been a pleasure. All right, thank you very much. Will you much come for back? Me. Come back anytime. Right, I appreciate it. Thank Look, you. We've, a lot. we've got notes and everything. It's like, okay. and, and we didn't even use them. I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> always a, lot. a pleasure, Doctor Tom Riddle. Thank you very much. We talked about horses that have done well. Three-year-old that was sensational last year, Monomoy Girl. She's a lock to be the three-year-old of the year in the Eclipse Award. What a prediction there. When we come back here on the Racing Show, we'll talk to her trainer, rising star in the business, Brad Cox. Welcome back to the Horse Racing Show. I think he could be the next big thing in horse racing, and I bet he loves that introduction I just gave him. He's Brad Cox, Monomoy Girl, a lock to be the three-year-old filly, nominated for Horse of the Year along with Accelerate and, of course, Justify. And Brad joins us now from Florida. Brad, thanks for being on. Thanks, Kenny. Thanks for having me on. So what's this year been like for you coming off the 2018 season? And you have uh, one of the, the best filly of the year for sure, and one of the most impressive fillies in a long time. Uh, what was that whole deal like for you to go through the campaign with Monomoy Girl? Well, it was, it was an amazing ride, um, you know, throughout her three-year-old year. And just, you know, just how consistent she was um, from start to finish, um, from basically – february through november she was just ultra consistent and you know stepped up and give us um, a big effort every time we let her over there so uh, it was a uh, it was a huge um, accomplishment um and she taught us a lot she's a very nice filly and hopefully uh, comes back as a four-year-old and can do uh you know stay stay unbeaten uh, um and and uh, continue to pick off grade ones as a four-year-old and what do you do now? What's the, the game plan for her in a perfect world, uh, giving her some rest right now, getting a little sun on her back in Florida? Uh, where do you go from here now with her, Brad, if everything goes as you hope? Well, next week she'll ship to the fairgrounds in New Orleans. Uh, that's where she wintered last year. Uh, we'll prepare her there for a start in either. But right now we're looking at either the Apple Blossom um, at Oak Lawn, I believe it runs April, the middle of April, um, or the La Troy Inn at Churchill is kind of the two races we have marked right now. But, you know, once we get her in, start training her, get closer, you know, ultimately she'll tell us when she's ready to run. But those are the races I feel like we have marked right now. And, you know, we try to string a, a group of grade one races together, um, you know, starting with those and hopefully ending at the Breeders' Cup at Santa Anita later this year would be the plan uh, right now. More people got to know Brad Cox last year. I mean, I've known you for several years, but more people got to know you. You know how it is when you have that breakout year. We've seen it with we've seen it with every trainer. Going back to I remember Bob Baffert having that when he brought Cavanier in years ago to the Derby in ninety six. Mm -hmm. Not everybody was familiar with him. Now that more people are getting familiar with you, how does this change things for you? Maybe at least you're getting more free dinners. I don't know. <laughs> yeah yeah no or, or or people expect you to take them out for dinner <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's probably but, it hey you won the breeders cup let's go to dinner on you <laughs> that's right that's right uh but no it, it, it's been good i mean it can only be a positive really um as far as you know attracting clients with um you know promising stock you know sending you horses that you know either they've had on their farms that they think a lot of or you know have them with a trainer in ocala or somewhere that um you know nice pedigree courses with nice pedigrees that or either were per purchased at a private auction so uh, it definitely you know attracts um you know quality horses and you know ultimately that's that's the goal is to um acquire those type of horses and um, have have you know breeders type horses monomoy girls uh, horses like that that's what you know, everybody's after in this game and uh, you know when you're able to you know, have one with the campaign she had, and uh, you know it just helps uh, your business. And you know that that way. That way. Uh, Brad Cox is with us here on the racing show. Of course, uh, the great 
Philly Monomoy girl. Her four-year-old cam campaign will begin a little later. Uh, Brad, as far as coming in the first year, you know, we all make our plans, what we hope to do where we're setting up time to take off work, vacation, or whatever. Uh, with you trainers, it's pretty much 12 months a year. But how far out do you try to plan for any of the horses you have? Do you get When you get the conditions book and you see the races that are available, uh, do, do you set it up on by a quarter system? Do you look half a year in advance, uh, or do you look week to week in advance? Oftentimes with uh, just – I would say the average horse, you're, you're looking at a monthly schedule. Uh, like you said, the condition book, um, like, for example, being at the fairgrounds right now, um, where we're running a lot of horses there on a month, the condition book lasts a month. So, you know, you work off, off that, you know, you always have your extras each day that come out on the overnight that you work off of, you know, trying to find races and spot your horses along the way. But, you know, I, w- I would say, you know, with the average horse with conditions, maidens, stuff like that, you're probably looking about a month in advance so you can kind of get a, an idea. Um, it's very difficult getting these horses in. People don't understand that lots of times, but, you know, getting them, get them in the, the proper spots can be challenging with, you know, right races filling, um, you know, what surface, you know, you're, you're trying to get them on. Uh, but for the most part, I'd say a month in advance. Uh, big horses like Monomoy Girl graded stake horses, you know, same thing, month six weeks two months in advance you can get a pretty good feel for what you're where you're going and where you're heading with them we're taping this before the eclipse award and you know you're a lock for the three-year-old filly do you have your tucks ready was it a rental or did you buy for this i bought one because i i'm hoping to go back in the future <laughs> that's what my son <laughs> told me the other day go ahead and buy one because hopefully you'll get to go back in the future but yeah that's the plan you're always hoping to to be able to attend something like that it's uh it's a prestigious um award you know the eclipse and uh, i'm just glad to be a part of it with this philly you know that's what makes you so good seriously you plan ahead it was a great move to go ahead and buy the tux because this will not be your last eclipse awards there my my biggest prediction ever on this the inaugural show there you go i hope it hope it holds true hey brad thanks so much for your time always appreciate it and uh, we'll catch back up with you during the season okay All right, sounds good, Kenny. Talk to you soon. All right, all the best. Brad Cox with us here on The Racing Show. We'll have more right after this. All right, thanks again, Brad Cox, and a smart move buying that tux because uh, I think years from now he'll still be attending uh, Eclipse Awards. Definitely on that. We thank all of our guests today, Brad, Mike Pegram, Always fun. You'll listen back to Mike Pegram's interview, I'll bet you. I'll bet you'll listen back one or two times to that. And Dr. Tom Riddle for breaking down about the foaling season, January 1st birthdays and all that. We look forward to talking uh, more with the veterinarians at Root and Riddle Hospitals as we continue on with the racing show. Uh, thank you for being with us. The Super Bowl edition is coming up again. Well, the Super Bowl is coming up again. The Super Bowl edition is coming up next week here. Yeah. What is, or you, what is that, April? Oh, this is a nice water bottle. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you for not opening it until right now as we get ready to say goodbye. Thomas, April, thank you. Ben Chaffins in there on bass and drums. Our lead guitarist and leader of the band, Scott Hall, thank you. Thank you for being with us. Join us again next week on this show we call simply The Horse Racing Show. I'm Kenny Rice. So long, everyone.